Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 98 of Interstellar Quest. And for those who have been asking where it is after the winter hiatus, well, it's here, obviously, right now. But where was it? Well, it was in deep space with the Interplanetary Lab, a spacecraft which I kind of built as I went along, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. But having realized that it took me a day to get it going, and it's probably going to take at least a day to get it stopped, it seems like a pretty bad plan, ultimately. Yes, this spacecraft may have everything you need. It may have oodles of power from its uh, antimatter-induced fusion power plant, but it also possesses noodle-like qualities. What do I mean by noodle-like qualities? Well, when uh, this, this thing is very, very long and narrow and joined together by docking uh, adapters, we've put on a bunch of struts where possible. However... Well, uh, when we try to pr apply any thrust to it, it just decides that it wants to be like a wet noodle in space. If you decide that you want to push it from one end, well, what happens is the thing just tends to wobble around and, and generally doesn't want to go in the direction that you want. So uh, you have to, you know, get it pointed the right way to start with. And getting it pointed in the right direction, as you can see, is... Uh, is annoying and slow and horrible and this thing wobbles around. This is obviously running at four times regular speed here because uh, it is a slow process. We can throttle up to about 30% thrust and then yes, well our velocity does actually slow down which is a good sign. Uh, the current periaps that we are targeting was just under a thousand kilometers and the actual periaps will occur in less than an hour. One of the upsides is that if you look at the antimatter collectors, they are kicking in big time, already collecting more antimatter per day than they ever got in low carbon orbit. That will actually be very useful when we try to land using the antimatter power. Now, of course, since we have some eyes in space, we can, of course, perform a crew report, except that we can't perform a crew report because we have not enough crew. This one, however, does have enough crew to get us very important information on Jewel. Glancing out of the viewport, you see a grey disc blitz by. You start to think you are not alone. Of course you're not alone. You've got Sidzi and Jurhat. What moron would send only one person on a, a trip to Jewel? I mean, sure, it's very important to have uh, the crew to support each other, to stop each other going mad, to provide a, you know, to spread the workload. But also, it's really important because after the fact, we want to have all those amusing stories about deciding who was going to be the first on any of the planets. I'm sure there will be some comical tale about a uh, Sidzi getting locked in the bathroom while Jurhat rushes out to the spacecraft and uh, makes his mark on uh, Tylo. Of course, if you're stuck in the bathroom and you eject the, the waste disposal at the correct time, you can also make your mark on various locations. Anyway, yes, as I said, this took hours and hours and hours and hours. Really, it took a ridiculous amount of time, and this is running at 12 times regular speed, and you can barely see things are moving. You might actually see the mouse pointer moving around randomly. What that is is I'm playing other games in the background and the recording is running in the foreground. The recording software re-renders the mouse pointer, even though it's referencing a window that's sitting on top of this one. That is, of course, your cue to start guessing what game I'm playing in the foreground. Meanwhile, I need to fill uh, several minutes of very slow approach to Jewel with uh, some interesting conversation, and I'm really uh, struggling. I mean, obviously there was that whole um, SpaceX thing. Uh, very impressive the way that it actually managed to hit a barge, although not actually stay on the barge. Better luck next time, right? But yeah, I'm sure you've already all talked about that. I mean, and I think I've run out of space poop story. I mean, I've already exceeded my space poop story for this uh, quota for this episode. I, I could tell a joke, I guess. Yeah, sure, that seems like a good idea. It'll either be funny or it'll be so awful that you will wish that you'd actually watched the full, unedited 15-hour deceleration, right? 
So yes, there's this fine gentleman and he's walking down the street in front of a, a very expensive property. He sees a very expensive car and out of that very, very expensive car gets an immaculately dressed and gorgeous lady followed immediately by an immaculately dressed and amazing looking man who has an orange for a head. Now, such sights are not commonplace, and so it piques the interest of her protagonist, who approaches the citrus-headed individual and, and asks, Excuse me, sir, I, I can't help but notice this is a very expensive car. Why, yes, it is. I can't help but notice that this is a very expensive house. Why, yes, it is, sir. And I can't help but notice you uh, also have a companion who is rather fabulous. Why, yes, she is. Also, you appear to have an orange for a head. I must admit that I'm more than a little curious as to what transpired to lead to these ma fabulous possessions and, uh, well, your uh, citrus-headed nature. Aha! Yes, of course! Yes, I'm often asked this question by uh, the other side of the family. Well, it is rather an interesting story. You see, I used to be an antique salesman. I had a little shop that nobody ever came into. And as I was cleaning it out one day, I found an old brass lamp, which of course I decided to make a little more presentable for sale. And so I cleaned this little bit of treasure. And uh, wouldn't you know, there was a flash, a bang, a cloud of smoke. I was knocked off my feet and and there before me stood a genie who declared, You have freed me from my eternal slumber. You may pick three wishes. Now I must admit I was rather sceptical, but uh, not to look a gift horse in the mouth, I decided to ask for a fabulous amount of money. And within hours I had enough cash to buy this house, this car and everything else you see. Good lord, really? I thought those kind of things were just fairy tales. So what was your second wish? Well, I wished for someone to share this with, and here is my wife, and she is the greatest treasure I have, despite all my vast wealth. Well, she really is stunning, I must say. And so, what was the third wish you made? Oh, well, I thought that would have been obvious. I wished that my head was an orange. Okay, yeah, this uh, joke thing isn't going to work, is it? Uh, so yeah, those of you who are trying to figure out which game I was playing, take a look at the mouse cursor. Yes, I was playing Crusader Kings 2. Yes, I was working my way through Europe or something like that. Uh, amusingly enough, to record the audio in this correctly, I had to turn off all the audio in Crusader Kings. And given that I actually bought all the music DLC for the game, that's actually really sad because I'm paid for music, which I'm not listening to. Anyway, eccentricity is almost below one, and bingo, now we transition into a closed orbit. Although, to be fair, uh, we'll actually have to slow down a little more because this highly eccentric orbit will still escape. You see that we're getting transient encounters with some bodies, but eventually, 75 days it is, and bingo, we now are captured. It's just a case of now slowing ourselves down into a suitable capture orbit. And actually, given the efficiency or given the yields that we're getting on the antimatter collectors, I want to bring the orbit all the way down in inside the orbit of Lathe. Now you can see me getting an encounter with Tylo, but I don't actually want to use that just yet because you can see that I would encounter it at very high relative velocity and probably wouldn't be able to kill the relative velocity in the time that I passed by the target. Also, now that we're within about 1,500 kilometers, it's time to get that second crew report. The green color of the atmosphere reminds you of the soft grass of Kerbin. Sort of. It reminds me of the green skin of Kerbals. Anyway, we continue to decelerate, and I'm sure the Kerbals on the spacecraft are also playing something like Crusader Kerbals too, right? I mean, they have a computer core there that's probably doing all sorts of fascinating science and stuff for them, right? Anyway, eventually orbital capture is complete, we're on an eccentric orbit, and the nice thing here is to see the level of the antimatter flux here, hundreds of times what you would get in Kerbin orbit. I've been wasting all my time building this giant collector array in Kerbin orbit when I could just send a pair of the pair of them here to do get the same effect. Anyway, that tedium is over for now. Now we've got all sorts of other types of tedium. First of all, we have one of the satellite landers, the dual sat lander one, which was originally intended to go to Val, 
but uh, we need to make some course corrections first to get ourselves close enough to Jewel that we can actually perform aero braking here. Interesting fact, of course, is that aero, like as in aerodynamics and stuff, that comes from the Greek word for air, but you can do aero braking in atmospheres that don't contain any air, right? Yes, we don't change the word aerodynamics when we are flying in a hydrogen atmosphere, and certainly we don't call it hydrodynamics because that's something completely different, right? Anyway, after performing that, it's still 11 days before it reaches periaps, so uh, it's time to go back to the Draco, which has been sitting on Moho waiting for a suitable return window. Not that it actually cares about return windows, but all the same, it does actually care about making sure that the engines are activated. There we go. Yes, the crew has finished all their tasks, and in fact, they're letting the... They're letting the autopilot do most of the flying right now. They're sitting down in the lab, obviously enjoying a cup of tea or something. Either that or the, the autopilot is perhaps just deciding that it wants to go and it's had enough of these guys. Don't worry, I'm sure it's perfectly normal for the spacecraft to be flying all on its own. Okay, now why? What is the button to retract the landing gear? Wait, I mean the other landing gear. Oh, no, that's closing up the cargo bay. Yeah, uh... Don't worry, this is perfectly normal. We're just keeping you in here for safekeeping. Ah, there we go. Okay, so now the automated spacecraft is on its way to orbit. Apple App's height is about seven. Let's make it just a little bit higher. In fact, for good measure, let's make it a lot higher. Okay, now we're getting up to speed here. Flying over the North Pole largely because we wanted to fly towards the sun. Look at the rough terrain there. That's how you know you're near the pole when the terrain gets super crinkly. Now while that is a, an artifact of the game engine, the way they, it treats spheres, there is actually something of a real world analogue on Mercury in the form of the Caloris Basin. Yeah, I'm just going to pick out uh, the planet Kerbin. Looks like our orbit isn't aligned. This will be a horrifically inefficient departure. We target Kerbin and then we just point our spacecraft at it on the nav ball. There it is there. There's the direction vector. And as uh, start accelerating away off to infinity. Yeah, the Caloris Basin on Mercury is the biggest impact crater. At least it was when Mariner 10 went by. I haven't looked at the new craters that have been filmed since then. Um... So it was a large impact crater. What happened was, of course, you had an impact and the shock waves spread out across the surface. Now, that works for a while. The shock waves spread out and get weaker and weaker, but then they start to go around the planet and they meet up on the other side. And on the exact opposite side of the planet from the Caloris Basin, you have your know, crazy terrain that has been ripped up by these shock waves, all traveling around the planet and focusing up on the other side. So at least in the case of Mercury, you actually have features that are correlated on opposite sides of the planet because of shockwave focusing. Anyway, after brute forcing my way out of orbit, we get a, a little encounter with Kerbin. That's obviously where we're trying to go. So uh, once we've, we've made this departure from orbit, the next thing we want to do is time accelerate to escape into deep space so that I can actually perform a course correction that will actually bring us back to the planet and takes a bit of faffing around with maneuver nodes and of course we have loads of delta v so we can go for a very aggressive return uh, the course corrections for a less aggressive return would probably be a lot lighter a lot you know a lot smaller it tells us this burn would be about two and a half minutes but of course uh, thanks to the wonders of time acceleration you only need to sit and watch it for um well, a lot less, I don't know. Not very much time at all. The crew is still hanging out in the lab. I mean, this is all cutting edge stuff. It, you know, it flies itself, it has fusion powered engines, fusion powered power source, and an amazing coffee maker in that lab, so I'm told. Yeah, the space station also has a specialized coffee maker as well. It's a cartridge based espresso system, I believe. Anyway, we're a few hours out from aero braking. It's time to make another little course correction here. Dropping the periaps down under, inside the atmosphere, 123 kilometers. Obviously, don't want to go too deep. And in fact, with this uh, better atmospheres and environmental visual enhancements, I seem to have got more than one atmosphere layer set up, which is why it flickers on and off all the time. Kind of frustrating, 
And uh, yeah, if you suffer from a strobe effects or whatever, you probably shouldn't be watching this. Yeah, I mean, at this point, the mod install is just a little broken and nobody's supporting it. So this is why I need to get this series over with so I can go on and do something else. Everybody's saying they want, or a lot of people are saying they'd like to see real scale solar, solar system. And I think that would be an excellent idea. Also an excellent idea is realizing that I was too high in my approach and therefore I should angle the spacecraft down to not only increase drag but also kind of provide a, an aerodynamic force downwards to perhaps add a little more braking to this. The eccentricity is down to 1.04, not low enough, so have to kick in the engines a little to slow me down. Just remember, these are super old technology, so they're not nearly as efficient as those fusion engines. These are the old school fission-based systems. This also comes with some external tanks that we want to get rid of. We'd ideally like to get rid of these things in some manner that would dump them into the atmosphere so they're not floating around in space. These were designed to be self-contained space probes. You see they actually have their own built-in propulsion system. Originally I thought they would make nice impactor probes, but you know they they are not going to do much impacting on Jewel. They're just going to fall down and they're probably going to burn up in the atmosphere. They don't have any heat shields or anything, but that's okay, we've got excess, we just don't want to carry the extra extra mass around. And you know, it's kind of funny, I realized that I did go out and develop uh, something with an inflatable heat shield, which was designed to go into Jules atmosphere and collect all the data all the way down. Completely forgot to actually fly that mission anywhere. So I'll probably have to send out a warp capable spacecraft just to drop something into Jules atmosphere. I'm hoping there's some way that I can contrive a vehicle which will leave some sort of intact debris on the surface. But I'm not guaranteeing anything. Anyway, meanwhile, back on the other side of the, the solar system, it's time for Draco to arrive at Kerbin, complete its uh, maneuver, and uh, yeah, it didn't perhaps didn't make a huge course correction here, so it's... Uh, flying past Kerbin at about 45,000 kilometers, so even if it kills its, uh, you know, relative velocity down to zero, it'll tilt, still probably take a few days for it to fall down to Kerbin. Not that they're in any rush, they're enjoying it, and, uh, you know, the spacecraft, I think, is just not letting them out. As I said, I think they're really enjoying the coffee machine on this vehicle. I mean, maybe the coffee machine only works properly when there's gravity so that the, the fluids flow in the correct direction. Without gravity, their coffee machine isn't working. Can you imagine having to queue up course corrections so that you could actually get a decent cup of coffee? That would drive me nuts. Okay, so now the Val lander. I think this is called Dual Sat lander. Uh, it's probably aiming for Val, but the problem is that it's in a kind of high inclination orbit. Anyway, the plan is to, uh, to get an encounter with one of the moons and use that to adjust the inclination. And there we go, Lathan counter. And yes, back at Kerbin, do you remember the Drez lander? I certainly had completely forgotten about it, but I get a, an alarm signal for it. So, uh, well, the alarm was a couple of days before the encounter, so I thought that I'd just set the thing up a little early. And then I realized, oh yeah, um, the closest approach here is 52,000 kilometers, and I was supposed to make a course correction to perform some aero braking. Because with the, the amount of fuel it has left, it's moving at 2.7 kilometers per second. And yeah, it turns out that it is going to run out of fuel before it can slow down sufficiently to be captured by Kerbin, which is why I set the initial time, the initial alarm clock for several days prior. So yeah, this is going to fly past and it's going to take its load of science off into deep space. Not that it has a particularly huge amount of science. After all, the Yoga One has already been there and told us all sorts of interesting things. Nevertheless, we shall pursue it and uh, collect what's left of it in a future episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.